So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another economics seminar uh, on valuing the public domain. Um, we are quite excited to have uh, with us uh, Chris Erickson from the University of Glasgow, who was one of the co-investigators uh, of a study that was commissioned uh, by the UK Intellectual Property Office uh, on precisely the topic of valuing the public domain. Just by way of introduction, as you know, in the intellectual property system, there is this inherent balance that policymakers try to strike between, on the one hand, giving incentives uh, towards um, um, creative and inventive activity, and on the other hand, recognizing that um, creative works and inventions uh, have um, public good characteristics and they should be disseminated as widely as possible. For that precise reason, intellectual property rights are usually time-bound, you know, if one leaves aside trademarks, uh, um, and once uh, um, exclusive rights expire, um, in a sense, uh, they move into the public domain and they are free for everyone to use. And for economists, uh, you know, that trade-off you know, is quite obvious, and I think it, it really goes back very much to the foundations uh, of the intellectual property system. But it has always been difficult to you know, sort of quantify how important really is the public domain and how is it actually used uh, by, um, by, by, by creators and by society at large. Uh, and for that reason, um, you know, we really welcome this study, uh, which um, originated uh, in efforts, uh, I think, by the UK Intellectual Property Office uh, to improve the evidence uh, base on which policymakers in the United Kingdom um, can make decisions, but it certainly has uh, implication and is of interest uh, going beyond the UK. And uh, in that sense, we are, we are glad that uh, uh, Chris has agreed uh, to present uh, the report uh, that uh, they have um, 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 come up with uh, um, here at a, at a WIPO economic seminar. Um, I probably should mention, and you might elaborate on the precise origin of it, uh, Chris is the one who is presenting this, but you know, this was a um, 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 co-product uh, with his uh, fellow investigators at the universities of, of Glasgow and, and, and elsewhere, and maybe you can say one or two words about that. Um, Chris asked that we leave aside you know, all the questions for the question and answer period. You know, we will make sure that um, you know, there will be sufficient time. Obviously, if you have extremely sort of pressing questions for clarification, um, you, know, you, can, you can always raise your hand. But you know, let's, let's leave all substantive questions uh, to the end if that's, if that's possible. So with these uh, introductory remarks, let me give the microphone to, to, to Chris. Uh, and I suggest maybe that uh, you present for you know, 40 to 50 minutes and then we still have time for questions and answers. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Thank you, Karsten. And, um, and if, I, if I do go over time, which um, I will try to keep myself to time. Okay. Just I can indicate. The time key. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to stand if that's okay so I can uh, see everybody in the room, hopefully. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me here, and um, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, uh, Carson informs me that this is a good turnout, and indeed it looks like a great turnout. So, so thanks very much, um, and I'm, I'm really excited to uh, share this research with you and get your uh, input and ideas about the, uh, the work as well. As Karsten mentioned, um, this is a, a work of um, collaboration with um, myself and Professor Martin Kretschmer at the University of Glasgow as the lead investigators, and co-investigators um, Paul Hild from the University of Illinois, and um, Fabian Homburg and Danusha Mendes from the Business School at um, Bournemouth University in the UK. So they're not here to, um, to present with me, and I'll be presenting some of their findings and research on, on their behalf. So please forgive me if I don't have all the answers to, to your questions. Some of the, the, the details were um, were worked out in collaboration with them. Okay, so um, we'll move ahead uh, fairly swiftly to keep everything uh, uh, to time. I want to leave a, a good amount of time at the end for, for questions and comments. Um, first of all, can everybody hear me? Is it coming through okay? Yeah? Okay, thank you. So this research uh, uh, has been summarized in an in a 80 page report which was published by the um, Intellectual Property Office in the United Kingdom in March. And you can download it, uh, the, the, the PDF in its entirety from uh, gov.uk. So if you're interested in um, uh, having a look at the report, you can either contact me and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to forward you along the, uh, the study or you can download it um, yourself from, from, from their website. 
And uh, to, to provide some, some uh, background to the study and why we did the study, <coughs> this, was, uh, this was commissioned essentially by the Intellectual Property Office uh, to um, generate new evidence and new findings about how the public domain might contribute value to the economy and the society of the United Kingdom. Uh, and they gave us the following brief, which was firstly to uh, map the size of the public domain and the frequency of its use, um, a, a, a somewhat impossible task, uh, as a matter of fact. There other people have, have applied different methodologies for trying to get a handle on the size of the public domain. And, and um, uh, 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 an academic named Rufus Pollock has, has done a lot of excellent work in that area, mapping the size of the public domain. Um, uh, the second uh, part of the brief was to analyze the role of the public domain in direct and indirect value creation for UK firms and the wider economy. And this is part of um, you know, the, 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 the political climate of the moment in the United Kingdom, which is uh, quite interested in this notion of the creative industries and the health of the creative industries and trying to promote uh, innovation uh, uh, and, and growth in that sector. Um, you know, and this is in the context of, a, of an economic downturn. Uh, and uh, and, and, and also in the context of a country which is a, which is a net exporter of, of, of cultural products. So, so it's very much um, comes out of the, the uh, UK political um, uh, uh, system, if you like. <coughs> the, the third part of the brief was to assist UK media companies in identifying and developing business models that draw benefit from the public domain. So it has an industry um, uh, uh, focus. <coughs> So uh, how well we managed to achieve these, these, these objectives, um, I leave that to, to you to, to, to decide. Our, our approach was to um, uh, really select three very specific um, markets uh, and, and, and domains of activity and try to get a handle on how the public domain um, contributed value in those particular areas. We didn't um, try to you know, enumerate the, the value of the public domain for the entire uh, economy, which I think is a task um, really, really be beyond um, uh, our, our research team. But we tried our best to understand how the public domain works in very particular case studies. And I'll talk about those um, uh, in a moment. <coughs> the first challenge was to define what we mean by the public domain. Uh, and journalists have a, have a particular definition of the public domain, which is information which finds its, its way out of the private sphere and into the, into the sort of the public sphere of knowledge. Um, we, we're interested in the copyright public domain. Uh, so these are, these are works um, and ideas and bits of information which are, which are free for uptake by all. That's our, our short um, definition. Um, but we built on literature, um, there's an extensive literature actually in, in, in terms of trying to define what, what we mean by the copyright public domain and trying to figure out where its boundaries might, might actually be. So in this table, um, which I, I apologize is hard to see, these are some of the proposed definitions of the public domain and the ones that we've chosen to adopt and the ones that we did not adopt for this study. So the main group of works which we consider are works which are out of copyright, either because they never qualified for copyright production, protection because they were created in antiquity or because the copyright term has expired. And in the UK, uh, that's, that's uh, mainly works which, which are, um, uh, which were created, uh, or sorry, it works, for which the author died more than 70 years ago is the best way of saying it. Uh, but we also include works which do not qualify for protection. So, um, you know, the, here, here we're interested in the idea expression dichotomy, right? There's lots of aspects of a work which are not actually protectable by copyright um, and which are actually able to be taken up and used as inspiration for other works. Um, but the, the, and the, the, the line at which um, you know, something goes from an idea to an expression and becomes an infringing use uh, is, is, is determined in the courts. <coughs> uh, it's been proposed that we consider privileged uses of work. So these are, these are uses which are permitted under copyright exceptions, like the, the exception for criticism and review. Um, and in a sense, that, you know, those types of uses are, are available to certain uh, members of the public in certain uh, circumstances, but we did not include uh, privileged uses in this study because they're not available to all users at all times, and we're interested in commercial use uh, as well as non-commercial use. <coughs> then s similarly, there are permitted, permitted uses of works permitted by uh, private ordering schemes like the Creative Commons and, and OpenGPL. Uh, and we do include some of those types of works, but only the works 
that don't specify uh, who the downstream user needs to be. So we don't actually include non-commercial licenses and we don't, we, we don't include uh, uh, vir viral, aggressively viral um, less licenses because those actually restrict what can be done with the work in, in downstream. We only uh, include what we call free and open uh, uh, types of licenses. Uh, finally, you know, we might think about works, uh, tolerated uses of works or, or, or uses of, of copyright works which are actually unknown to the rights holder as a kind of uh, pseudo or quasi public domain. So fan fiction, you know, which exists outside of the purview sometimes of the rights holder. Is this, does this constitute a public domain? Well, no, uh, from our perspective, because, you know, those, those tolerated uses can, can become untolerated if, if the rights holder uh, emerges and discovers the use. So we did not include that type of, that type of infringing use in our study. Okay. So the three empirical uh, cases which I want to talk about today uh, really briefly, our first, a um, study of uh, uh, small and medium-sized creative businesses in the UK who've used public domain works uh, successfully in a commercial setting. Uh, we performed interviews with some uh, 23 of those firms and uh, ima examined their managerial decision-making around uptake and use of the public domain works. Second, uh, crowdfunding platform. We looked at um, uh, Kickstarter pitches, which incorporated public domain inputs in their... Uh, uh, pitch, and uh, we have some, some quantitative data about that, which I'll share with you. And thirdly, uh, we looked at the inclusion of public domain imagery on Wikipedia subpages to try to estimate the total value to Wikipedia and society that the public domain av availability of those images add. So uh, quickly moving on to study one, <coughs> which is on the uptake of public domain materials by UK firms. So here, uh, we're interested in the factors that prompt decisions by creative managers to take up and use public domain materials in the first place. And this is responding again to the brief from IPO to get a grip on the type of business models that um, small firms might be employing when they use uh, non-excludable, non-rival um, public domain inputs. <coughs> and we look at their strategic decision making in that context. So we generated a sample of firms by searching backwards on known public domain works like uh, Sherlock Holmes, like um, uh, 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 Darwin's um, publications. We have a, a, a long list of public domain works which we searched on. We found commercial exploitation uh, and then we sought out those firms and, 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 and sought to interview them. <laughs> So uh, in terms of the academic uh, context of this research, this fits, I think, in, in two broad uh, literatures. The first literature is a sociology of media work and management studies, which looks at how creative firms manage themselves and how they view their, um, their use of intellectual property. Uh, and there's an interesting kind of prevailing debate in, in this literature about the make or buy decision in uh, small firms with um, you know, Hotho and Champion pointing out the dilemma that, f that, that small studios face when they either decide to do work for hire, which essentially is building on someone else's in-licensed IP, uh, uh, in a, in a, essentially as, 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 and having no further intellectual property right in the finished product, as you would do if you, if you created the video game for Toy Story 3, for example. You wouldn't necessarily have any secondary rights in that, in that, in that work. Um, uh, or to create original, original works uh, from scratch, which is, uh, you know, has been highlighted as, as one of the aims of creative studios because these people want to uh, express themselves creatively and, and, and do creative work. We propose a third option, which is that these creative firms actually might use and build upon work which is in the public domain. Um, so they don't have an, an excludable right to the, uh, to the source material, but they might build upon it anyway for a variety of reasons. And the other literature which we, we think contributes to this understanding is literature on user-led innovation, on um, uh, private collective innovation, and on uh, the management of commonly held uh, resources in other types of innovation uh, uh, industries. <coughs> so we're essentially proposing to think about this uh, decision within the firm as similar to uh, other types of open innovation decisions in other firms in other industries. And we're looking for, for um, uh, uh, fit or not with our, with our propositions there. <coughs> okay, so why do the SMEs actually take up and use work which is in the public domain? <coughs> um, there are a variety of incentives that we, that we identified. Uh, one of the important incentives is that the public domain work already has a pre-existing audience. 
So in a sense, uh, rather than coming to the market with an untested idea, the uh, uh, small studio can come to the market with something that already has wide appeal. And that was expressed by this um, uh, company that did a digital uh, interactive theater adaptation of Dracula, saying it's so well known, it's lodged in our imagination, it connects with our subconscious, um, and it was really a love of the book, of the original material. Uh, the production seemed to connect with people, and it's good to capture the magic of something. So y you see a lot of uh, uh, affective language in here, and you see a lot of references to the um, power of a pre-existing audience, and that comes up quite a bit in our, in our qualitative research. <coughs> Here's another uh, company which uh, uploads fairy tale songs, or sorry, um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, nursery rhyme songs to YouTube, uh, uh, of which the nursery rhymes are in the public domain. And this person uh, worked in the music industry uh, in rights clearance for uh, about a decade before the, uh, uh, she struck out on her own. And um, she comes to the table with pre-existing knowledge of rights clearance. And she voices this other uh, uh, incentive, which is that working with public domain materials doesn't carry the transaction costs of tracking down the rights holder and asking for permission. So here, you know, she was able to, to um, uh, build upon her knowledge of what was in and what was out of copyright in order to uh, essentially lower her operating costs. But um, the downside was because it was non-excludable, uh, she quickly found a, a, a raft of imitators which joined her on YouTube, also uploading uh, uh, nursery rhymes based on public domain uh, songs. So um, these are the, uh, largely the two, the two incentives on the incentive side. <clears throat> in terms of the protectability, so the problem of the protectability of the underlying inputs, um, here's a, a, a medium-sized video game studio discussing the problem of protectability and saying, well, um, you know, I think that within the video game sector, you're in a different position compared to film and TV in that you can't really copyright gameplay ideas anyway. So really the only IP that we're going to create is the product that we make. There's nothing stopping anybody saying, oh, they did that really well. We'd really like to do that and make our own Jack the Ripper documentary uh, and, you know, reusing the materials and heavily taking the gameplay style and things like that. So for this uh, interview subject, uh, he already deals with the problem of protectability in a copyright industry. That in the video game sector, uh, uh, he and other studios already struggle with protecting the core ideas of their gameplay. They can protect the source code as a literary work, but as we were talking about earlier, uh, protecting the, the essence of the game, the look and feel and the interface and whatnot is already a challenge. So um, they already face a challenging IP environment. <coughs> uh, an important theme as well emerged in terms of searchability and quality. So uh, the firms that did successfully commercialize public domain inputs uh, really relied heavily on the availability of the public domain work either with a memory institution or with some other uh, archive or, or museum or, or, or place where they could locate and actually use the public domain input. And this person was, a, was an author from Bristol who uh, is, is, is quite keen on uh, the annals of Bristol in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century by John Latimer. Uh, and he uh, says they're very expensive to find them in print, uh, but all of a sudden they're available online through um, archive.org, an internet repository. And now, um, you know, anyone can go and use this, this material and draw inspiration from it. And he talks about an example of that, where a bunch of steampunk authors showed up at his house one day and asked him about uh, the history of Bristol, and he was able to point them to this resource, which they used as inspiration for a, for a product uh, which is this uh, volume of short stories which was published last year by Wizard Tower Press on um, Bristol, a sort of uh, science fiction novel, if you like, about Bristol in the 19th century. But it draws on this public domain material, which is the, the Annals of Bristol in the 19th century by John Latimer. And here you can see it sitting on uh, Internet Archive. And you can flip through and actually access the digitized material. So again, you know, searchability, quality, metadata, um, you know, availability of public domain works is really uh, something which, which was, was stressed by these firms. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> we analyzed this using a business model uh, uh, and, and a strategic um, uh, management uh, uh, orientation. Um, and we, we've built on the concept of the, of the value chain, the generalized um, concept of the value chain, to examine where precisely in the activity of uh, value generation, public domain inputs actually fit 
in the uh, uh, cases of the companies that we examine. <coughs> And we found uh, four uh, particular kind of business model types, if you like, following from Baden Fuller and Morgan uh, in their recent um, call for, for, for business model um, uh, abstraction. <coughs> uh, and so the first type of, of business that we examined, what we call portfolio builders, these are essentially firms which are still working in a work for hire mode. Uh, they're essentially partnering with a public institution like a university or an arts council and they're being commissioned to create a project of some public significance. So this might be the 150th anniversary of the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species or something similar to that. Um, and they're being commissioned on that, on that basis. Uh, their, their competitive advantage, if you like, comes from their creative capabilities uh, and their investment in the quality of the creative goods which they make. Uh, and which, which they hope to win future commissions. But that's not a particularly sustainable approach unless they're able to connect the dots and, and line up further, further commissions. Interestingly, the user uh, is quite important in this, in, this, in this model because it's the user uh, who has the, the, the interest in the public events, if you like. It's the local community where the, where the firm is located, where they're essentially serving a, a latent demand in, in, in the community. And the value proposition is meeting the public demand at the appropriate place and time and context. Technology platform developers uh, essentially have proprietary IP in the underlying technology platform. So there's one company we looked at uh, called Onilo, and they sell a uh, whiteboard animated software system for primary schools that let teachers show animated school books uh, to children. And they offer a subscription-based model uh, and they have a catalog of copyright but also public domain works which you can buy on this platform. The public domain works were some of the first works that they offered because they were free and they were investing mainly in the technology platform not in the content. So, the, so in that sense the public domain material was a placeholder and later they invested in, in, lic in licensing copyright uh, books and materials. So they are a hybrid of both copyright and, and, and public domain work. Um, you know, and here, and here they're integrated across the, 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 the value chain right through marketing and distribution right to the user um, more so than, than some of the other firms. Uh, fan community engagers, these are people who are, uh, for example, fans of, a, of a, a literary work like Sherlock Holmes or fans of Shakespeare who uh, uh, essentially build a business on the back of their involvement in the community. And here, uh, there's tremendous importance in, in terms of their relationship with the users and the other fans who they serve. So their competitive advantage actually emerges from the relationship that they're able to build with the fan communities that purchase their, their, their content. Because essentially, again, it's non-excludable. Anybody could come in and offer similar content. But their, their advantage comes from having a pre-existing relationship with a, with a fan base. <clears throat> Finally, uh, you know, these entrepreneurs, these are traditional media companies. They invest in both uh, copyright and public domain and original works. Uh, and they're very good at spotting market opportunities, spotting demand, and offering products to, 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 to meet that demand. Uh, they're very sophisticated in their knowledge of IP. They will license when they need to. If they don't need to, if, if something's in the public domain and they see an opportunity, they will exploit that as well. Um, and they, uh, uh, when it comes to protecting their, 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 their investment in public domain works, their strategy tends to be in terms of investments in marketing being bigger than others and also being first to market with quality products. So when we examine uh, you know, this qualitative data in, in respect of, of this theory from uh, Von Hippel and Von Crow on, on, on private collective creativity, I think we find some interesting connections. Um, uh, you know, for Von Hippel and Von Crow and the subsequent authors, the, the incentive for in, engaging in this kind of private collective uh, uh, innovation, innovation where you don't own the underlying uh, inputs, uh, might be, for example, to diffuse an innovation which increases the innovator's profits through network effects. And we see this somewhat with the, plat with the technology platform's uh, strategies. We might also see, uh, you know, a strategy of incorporating free software to help fulfill the credible promise uh, of, a, of a prototype. So putting in placeholder public domain content to show investors what the product will look like is a, is a strategy that we see the firms uh, engaging in. We see, uh, you know, Von Crow and, and later authors, um, Sturmer and all, talking about lower costs of IP protection. There's nothing to protect, uh, you know, other than the underlying technology IP, but that's a different system uh, in, in the video games sector. 
um, and uh, an increased speed to market, which we do see occurring across the, the, the board of, of, of firms that we've looked at. Uh, one thing that, that, that we need to emphasize, though, is that this all, all comes with costs. It's not like pr public domain materials are just free. Um, there are search and integration costs, as Hayfliger um, uh, and, and colleagues point out. Um, there's difficulty in differentiating from the competition. There's a, 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 you know, when you're engaging with user communities in a close uh, relationship, uh, there's, a, there's a, the difficulty of holding back certain proprietary business information and other, other strategic information. Uh, the cost of managing communities and uh, generally organizational inertia with respect to working in this mode, which is quite different from working, for example, with a fully licensed uh, IP. How are we doing for time? Fine, you have at least another 25 minutes. Perfect, okay, great. Um, I'm sorry if I've been rushing through. There's a lot of material in, in the report. I'll try to slow down a little bit. Uh, this next study is a quantitative study of um, uh, pitches on Kickstarter. A quick show of hands. Is anybody, are you all familiar with Kickstarter? Yeah. yeah? Okay, well, Kickstarter is a, a crowdfunding platform. It, it, it offers the ability for um, strangers to fund uh, products in the pre-production phase. And the two types of products, if you could broadly break them down into physical design products, uh, which might be protected by design right or patent, and then uh, copyright uh, products, like media, essentially media products. We're focusing on media products on Kickstarter in the first quarter of 2014. We developed a computer-assisted extraction tool which gave us all of the products in four categories for those three months in the first quarter of 2014. Those were comic books, theater, publishing, which is essentially uh, print publishing, and video games. So a, a, a mix of, of quite different uh, sectors represented. And we looked at those works uh, in the with using the following perspective. We imagined that a pitch creator, that's somebody who wants money from the crowd, when they go to Kickstarter to try to raise money, they have essentially four different types of project they could pitch. They could develop and publish original content. They could obtain a license and republish an existing copyright work in a new setting or new format. They could reuse work from the public domain. You see our interest in that. Uh, or they could do so, some combination of the three. They could remix uh, copyright work with some new public domain inputs. And in fact, we see some evidence of that happening as well. So we think we've covered, at least in the media products, we've covered the different approaches that pitch creators could take. And we want to know to what extent the IP status of those pitches influences their chances of success in the funding that they receive. Does it help if you have a copyright license when you go to Kickstarter, essentially? Uh, most of the existing literature, and there's a growing literature on um, crowdfunding, focuses on the problem of information asymmetry between pitch creators and pitch funders or backers. Um, backers don't have very good information about the likelihood of the seller to deliver a product, and that's sort of the danger of crowdfunding. When you invest, you don't know if the funder is just going to take all the money and run off to, um, to Thailand or Cuba or whatever, or whether they're going to deliver um, the, the product, or even if they do deliver the product, whether it will live up to expectations. And here's a, a, you know, a bunch of recent literature on that. Essentially, what we get from that literature is that um, uh, the importance of reputation signaling, so these signals that, back, that pitch creators could send to backers to signal their, their likelihood of succeeding, these are things like your social network profile. How many friends do you have on Facebook? Do you trust people that have a lot of friends on Facebook? Well, you know, uh, some of the uh, empirical evidence suggests that is important. Um, but we think that, that, that the IP status might work in a sense as a kind of reputation signal in the, uh, in the transaction over the, uh, over the uh, crowdfunded good. Um, the other pro another problem is that you know, these are non-repeated transactions. It tends to be a, a, a hit and run where you just get funded once. You don't keep coming back to Kickstarter the way people come back to eBay over repeated transactions, which would allow you to rate sellers, for example. You can't really do that on Kickstarter. Um, there are low incentives for individuals to do due diligence because the amount that you back is very small. You might only give $10 or 10 pounds or, 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 or what have you, you, and you have low incentives to do diligence on that amount of money. Uh, and in general, I mean that, you know, and, and we spoke about this earlier, that the ethos of, of crowdfunding is to fund people who are 
not mainstream, right? It's the point of Kickstarter is, is ostensibly to fund new, original, untested, uh, independent projects. And so these creators, um, you know, just by definition are likely to be somewhat riskier than uh, corporate uh, providers. So uh, one of our hypotheses is that IP status of projects serves as a quality indicator to potential backers, increasing their confidence in the quality of the good. And here we're looking at funding level, which is one of the, one of the uh, variables that we were able to extract from the pitches using our, our tool. Our second set of hypotheses relates to just the transaction. So, so essentially when you go on Kickstarter, uh, you ask for a set amount of money, and if you raise the money within the, the, the threshold period, then it's a success and you have to deliver the good. But you've set the price as the seller. So in a sense, this is, success is independent from the total amount of funds raised because I could go and ask for $500 and have a better chance perhaps of, of raising my $500 than somebody who goes and asks for $25,000. So here we're interested in simply whether or not the, the, the IP might work as a lubricant to help these transactions uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, meet with success. <coughs> So our data consists of two th uh, nearly 2,000 projects which were pitched, uh, which were just the natural you know, flow of sample uh, of, of projects during those three months which were successful, unsuccessful, or suspended for various reasons. Um, and it, again, it includes those, those, those categories. Um, and of course, we excluded pitches where there was no copyright good. This happened, to, like for example, theaters that were asking for new lights uh, would not have been included in our sample. So the variables that we collected on were, uh, first of all, success, whether the, the transaction succeeded and the funder got funded within the, the amount of time, uh, the amount of funds raised, the number of backers attracted to the, to the pitch, uh, the type of media, the, the source of the intellectual property. And here we used human coders to determine uh, the presence of either licensed or public domain intellectual property in the pitch. And this was uh, actually more straightforward than we thought. Uh, pitches were very explicit most of the time about what they contained, what the, what the project would contain. Um, uh, and then also uh, the, the public domain rationale. So when public domain works were used, how were they used? Was it because they had expired, because they were never protected, because they didn't meet the threshold of originality, or because they, they, they pertain to a, to, a, to a Creative Commons license? That is a mistake. It should not say exceptions. It's Creative Commons. <coughs> uh, and when it was licensed, when it was used a, 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 a third-party copyright work in a licensed way, uh, whether or not the license had already been sought from the license holder, or whether they said they would, they, would, they would pay a license after they raised the Kickstarter money, that's obviously important to know. Um, we also wanted to, to, as much as possible, control for the expertise and uh, reputation of the pitch creator. So we recorded information about their status in, in the wider community and their previous experience, the size of the team involved, um, the gender of the creator or creators, and whether or not the pitch was accompanied by a video, which has been shown to be important in previous studies. <coughs> so what we find uh, just descriptively is that 83% um, uh, of all projects were original, primarily original. 11% uh, contained third-party copyright work, 6% contained public domain, uh, giving us our total of 1,993. Now, the concentration of public domain works differs across with a higher proportion, interestingly, in uh, graphic novels and comics, as well as theater, and a lower proportion in video games and publishing. <coughs> We find a high degree as well, so this previous um, sh simply uh, records the primary status of the pitch. This uh, uh, shows us in the light purple the amount of our sample which constituted uh, work which actually contained multiple inputs. And this could be original work by the author, third party copyright work, or um, in 12% in, uh, of those cases, uh, uh, original work, public domain work, and third-party copyright work. So we see a, a quite high degree of transformative uh, recombination. <coughs> Here's uh, in response to uh, a hypothesis uh, in group one related to the overall funding. Uh, we do find uh, support uh, for the hypothesis that 
uh, presence of public domain material raises the total funds attracted to projects. So this shows the, the red line is the mean across all. The first group of a bar chart is um, all projects. The bottom is those which only include uh, public domain works and, and you can see a slight increase in total funds raised in certain categories such as in video games. But that does not equate to success as, as, as we've already covered. So when we look at uh, 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 binary logistic regression for, um, or sorry, no, a uh, 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 simple regression on uh, price, uh, this is uh, funds raised essentially. We see significance for uh, projects where there was uh, permission already sought from the rights holder and use of a third party work. This is significantly associated with a higher funding level achieved. Uh, when we look at public domain works compared to the reference category of original works, we see also significant uh, 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 for um, works where the primary input was public domain for a higher funding level achieved. Here's the, 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 um, the binary regression for uh, success and we see a significant uh, influence of both public domain inputs and third-party copyright licensed work in predicting success of uh, Kickstarter projects in our, in our sample. So per seeking permission is uh, significantly important here uh, for those projects which do use third-party copyright work. Uh, so it does appear as though that uh, is acting as a signal. We see that the most significance uh, is in the theater category for the success rate of public domain projects. Uh, and I think this uh, essentially reveals the um, uh, particular effect of um, Shakespearean theater and, and, and in, in, in this category that there's a tremendous uh, 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 affection for Shakespeare in theater production. Um, but here we show generally the odds plots across the four categories. And what we're interested in here is the uh, first so I don't want to shine a laser in anybody's eyes, but if you look at the top plots in all four quadrants, that relates to the um, public domain success rate and the red line being, being uh, 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 just, just one. So we see higher success rate across comics, theater, and games, but not uh, significantly in publishing for uh, a success rate of, of works which incorporate public domain uh, inputs. <clears throat> so I think that's quite interesting that um, both public domain and copyright works were significant in, in likelihood of success on Kickstarter. I think that's somewhat counterintuitive because Kickstarter's ethos again is uh, about um, uh, untested and, and original uh, work that actually um, known public domain works and, and known uh, copyright works should perform so well there. Uh, and we see difference across the categories, which is interesting, and I think um, this warrants further study. We, we suggest that one of the reasons why the publishing category uh, does not uh, seem, to, seem to be significantly uh, influenced by the, 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 the public domain inputs is that most of the public domain works that we're referring to are already books, right? The vast majority of public domain work is literary work because literary works have had time to expire. So it, the, it could be that the funders on Kickstarter are rewarding adaptation and recombination by uh, 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 seeing those literary works adapted to different genres like video games and comics. That might be what we're, what we're observing. Um, <coughs> uh, and, but we did also find uh, a significance uh, of importance of the status of the pitch creator and their reputation um, uh, as well. Okay, moving to the third uh, study which examined the uh, value of public domain photographs on Wikipedia. And this was led by Professor Paul Hild, who's a professor of law and economics at the University of Illinois. <coughs> so the methodology here was to um, essentially uh, build a data set of Wikipedia pages relating to uh, people whose lives uh, 
took place either before or after the line separating works which would be in the public domain and works which, which, which would be in copyright. In the United States, that's more or less um, equivalent to, to 1923. And, and remember here that although we're, we're using authors, composers, and lyricists as the sample of pages, the copyright work in question is not relating to their work as authors, but relating to uh, any photographs of them while they were alive. So essentially, by, by knowing the birth and death dates of a large sample of creators who are likely to have Wikipedia pages, we can figure out how um, important the public domain status of the imagery about them is to uh, uh, populating their Wikipedia pages. And if we imagine that Wikipedia pages are enriched by the presence of illustrations and graphics and photographs, then we essentially can, can get some sense of the value that's contributed to Wikipedia by the availability of those, of those public domain images. And that's what we've tried to do in this study. <coughs> so essentially, uh, uh, um, uh, the, first, the first thing to see is simply the distribution of 362 pages on Wikipedia relating to famous authors uh, that the availability of images about them declines over time as we get closer to the modern period. But this is counterintuitive because there are more cameras in the world, there are more photographers in the world uh, since, since in 1890. So why are there less photos available on Wikipedia of these, of these famous authors? Well, we think it has to do with the copyright status of images that might have been taken while they were alive. And the reason why it drops off after 1900 is because those authors would have been in their 20s in 1923 and so photographs of them when they were working as authors are likely to still be in copyright and held by the or original photographer of, 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 those, of those creators. So that's why we think we see a, an actual decline in uh, the amount of availability. And when we look at the, uh, the, 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 the legal status of the author, images of authors, um, the, one of the great things about working with, with data from Wikipedia is that page builders, editors on Wikipedia, when they upload images, they have to be very judicious about explaining the licensing of the image that they use. Wikipedia doesn't like to use uh, copyright images. They, they can rely on fair use, but they have very strict, uh, uh, they place quite strict restrictions on, on editors about when they can make fair use of copyright images. So some 80% some of the images uh, that were available of all the authors we looked at were, were, were actually public domain images. <coughs> In terms of the justification that editors gave when uploading images uh, to our sample of pages, uh, uh, half of them were uploaded because it was an image which was in the public domain due to copyright expiry. There are other ways that, that the work could have found its way into the public domain, however, such as being uh, dedicated by the uh, creator through, a, through a, uh, for example, Creative Commons type um, attribution or uh, through, through uh, reliance on, 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 on fair use or through uh, some uh, 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 for formalities in the U.S. copyright law about which I'm not entirely familiar and which uh, Paul Hild uh, uh, understands better than I do with respect to registration of copyrights and there was a, a change over a period of time. <coughs> so we, we, we clearly see that the public domain uh, status of images over time does seem to increase the likelihood of an image appearing on Wikipedia. Um, how much value does this add to Wikipedia or, or by extension to society in terms of other perhaps commercial information service providers that might be like if you can imagine a commercial version of Wikipedia that could make use of the same imagery in their own uh, business. <coughs> One thing we've used here to try to estimate value is an interesting phenomenon that we discovered which is that many of these images, this is uh, Rudyard Kipling, are uh, available for licensing from Getty and Corbis. They offer essentially the identical image as, uh, 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 as a commercially licensed work. But, um, but the work is also available free on, creative, on Wikimedia Commons and tagged as uh, out of copyright due to um, expiration of, of, of the copyright term. So, uh, so we found this puzzling, but it, it gave us a, an idea about how to perhaps place some kind of commercial value on the used imagery on Wikipedia, which is to use this yearly license, digital license fee uh, 
uh, as a benchmark for trying to establish some form of cost savings to Wikipedia by using equivalent images which are in the public domain. <coughs> so um, so one, of the, one important thing here to determine is whether or not uh, the, public the copyright public domain, the term expiry public domain, is the only source of a photo compared to, for example, Creative Commons. Uh, because if we're talking about cost savings, we have to imagine other ways that Wikipedia could obtain the image, right? So if the author is still alive, um, we could pay a license fee to Corbis for a digital image of the author, or maybe we could get on a plane, fly to Canada, track the author down, take a picture of the author with their permission, and then bequeath that image to the public domain. That's another way that an image of that author could potentially enter the, enter the public domain. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the costs uh, for generating those sort of Creative Commons licensed images depend a lot on the nature of the subject matter that we're trying to, trying to photograph. So, um, you know, this is very much just a rough estimate because Wikipedia covers such a vast amount of different topics. Um, looking at a, at a random sample of 300 Wikipedia pages in all shows that about half of them contain images and 87 of those containing images cite the public domain, the copyright public domain, as the source of the image. Um, so Paul Hild, uh, taking the license fees which, which are available for images from, from Corbis and Getty, which are identical images to the ones which Wikipedia is already using, uh, and multiplying those across all English language Wikipedia pages, um, uh, uh, the w where public domain images could be used, finds a total uh, cost savings uh, equivalent license of 200 million U.S. dollars. Um, now, of course, this is just a, 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 a essentially a thought exercise, um, but but that is one one way that we could calculate um, the value of those of those public domain pictures. Another way to think about how to calculate the, the, the value is to think about the value that the use of those public domain images actually adds to Wikipedia as a resource. And one proxy for this value is visitorship. So if we believe that public domain or images of any kind add uh, uh, usability to a page and attract more visitors, then perhaps we can calculate the total amount of visitors which come to Wikipedia as a result of the added images which they've used from the public domain. And that's what we tried to do by using a matched pairs methodology, which controls for the different levels of popularity and interest in the authors, lyricists, and composers that we used in our sample. So we tried to pair uh, unsuccessful authors with one another and popular authors with one another. And we used two, two ways of doing that. One was to take their number of, of reviews on Amazon.com as, um, as a measure of their overall popularity. The other way was to look at their lowest traffic ever received on the author pages, and we call that their sort of ambient popularity. That's their popularity if no university course is happening that week, no one, they haven't suddenly been featured in a film or, you know, because Wikipedia's traffic is quite volatile. So by taking the, the very, very lowest level of traffic achieved, we think that's a one way of, 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 of pairing them off. And what we find here, so apologies, this graph is sort of, um, intuitively reversed, but we find that for author pages where there are images um, uh, which are in the public domain, we find, depending on whether they're an author, a lyricist, or a composer, we find a 17 to 19 percent increase across the sample of authors who received an image on their page since 2009, paired with authors who never received any image on their page. So authors' pages that received images which were in the public domain since 2009 show a 17% increase in traffic received. And by r calculating this all out according to the percentages of presence and the 300 random pages of Wikipedia that we, that we, that we sampled, uh, we come to a total yearly uh, contribution of um, $33,900,000 in terms of the additional traffic which Wikipedia enjoys as a result of the presence of those images. And the, uh, th that, that, that dollar value, if you like, is essentially the equivalent that a commercial web operator might hope to earn from advertising revenue on a per-click basis from the added traffic that their website would receive. Um, and, and to use that, we calculated, uh, we used the figure of 
three cents per visitor, which is a which is a widely estimated value per visitor on commercial websites. Although that of course fluctuates as well, so this is also a rough calculation. But the purpose of this of, of this was to give you a general sense of two perspectives that we could have on 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 value in Wikipedia, and uh, uh, you know, and one one further thing which we're quite interested in understanding more about is what happens to all of this Wikipedia content downstream of Wikipedia. Because the website has essentially cleared the, 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 the rights and some of this material by licensing it on a free and open source basis, and because it incorporates free and open licensed images or public domain expired images, then it's free to be taken up and used by journalists, software developers, other innovative companies. We don't have any sense of the size of the downstream use of the Wikipedia resource. But we think if we could extend this finding to looking at what other users are, are building upon uh, Wikipedia, then we could perhaps, sorry, we could perhaps come up with a third uh, way of, w way of um, calculating the value that this, that this contributes. Okay, so to, to quickly close, <coughs> I hope I've convinced you that the public domain uh, and its presence is important to uh, innovation and creativity, uh, that there is uptake of it uh, taking place and that there's uh, lots of potential for, for innovation. Um, I think the findings suggest that there's a lack of knowledge among some users and practitioners uh, and that there could be policy implications in terms of improving information systems, improving archives, searchability, metadata, and other uh, uh, forms of collecting and sorting and making available work which is in the public domain. I've argued elsewhere that, you know, I think, this, I think what this shows is that the public domain is constituted by use. So the use constituted public domain means that you can change the law to, uh, you know, allow, in theory, a whole group of new works to enter the public domain. But unless the businesses and actual users can locate and make use of that work, then it's not really in the public domain. I mean, it's theoretically in the public domain, but not unless it can be used in, in, in new innovation. Um, it's interesting that across the, at least the first and second studies, we do find that, that use of public domain material uh, seems to go hand in glove with licensing in of copyright material. Successful firms use some public domain stuff, but they also pay a license fee, and they tend to be improving their knowledge over time about, about um, the, the opportunities which exist in terms of licensing in other, other, other intellectual property. So this isn't a, simply a case of uh, taking money away from rights holders and, 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 and giving companies stuff for free in the public domain. It's actually about companies that are quite... Um, quite uh, strategic in terms of their, their use of different inputs um, uh, when, they, when they can. And finally, uh, you know, the overall point that I think uh, we ought to be taken from this study is that um, you know, previous uh, accounting for, for um, the, you know, the economic size of, for example, the copyright industries uh, is missing the important uh, contribution made by uh, public domain and other alternative inputs to, to creative production. And that if we're going to, to engage in, in, in discussions about the overall uh, you know, value inputs and outputs of, of the creative industries for the economy, we do need to consider not only the work which is copyright and excludable, but all, also the, the, the non-excludable inputs and outputs. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Um, one thing that I completely forgot to do at the outset was to properly introduce you. Um, I don't know why I did this, especially because you have, I think for any economist, uh, the enviable title of Lord Calvin Adam Smith Fellow in Social Sciences. Uh, so apologies for that. Um, uh, Chris Erickson, Erickson holds a PhD in political geography from the University of Washington in, in Seattle, and his research interests, uh, you know, centers uh, on um, um, intellectual property in the in the creative economy, and he, he's affiliated uh, with Create, which understand is a consortium of uh, researchers, uh, which is led out of the University of. Glasgow that uh, studies uh, the creative economy. So apology, apologies, uh, I should have mentioned these uh, biographical details uh, at the outset. But let me open the floor. Let me first of all thank um, um, Christopher for um, not only presenting one studies but actually three studies uh, in, in, in one seminar. 
Um, I think they all gave really interesting and different perspectives uh, on, on, on the value of the public domain. But let me open it uh, to, to questions and answers, um, comments. Uh, please, uh, if um, you want to um, um, make a, raise a question or make a comment, please use the microphone. And if you could identify yourself, uh, that, that would be appreciated. Somebody wants to break the ice? Marcella. I think we have to cut. Can you? Oh, okay. There we go. There. Well, uh, first of all, I'm sorry I was a little bit late, and thank you very much, uh, to Waipo and uh, the author, for this uh, study. My name is Marcela Paiva, and I'm from the Permanent Mission of Chile to WTO and WIPO. Uh, well, I would like to thank you for your study. Uh, we have a very deep interest in a, in a principal basis to public domain, but I believe that this study clearly gives us more uh, sound information regarding the economic value as well that it might have for us as, as countries. So this is very important. I thought that a lot of findings are very interesting. Um, the combined models of exploitation that you could identify in one of the studies um, also, the, the low knowledge of copyright principles from users, I think that's something that's across the board, not only in public domain, but in, in general, and, and maybe the, the role of libraries and archives that I also think it's very important that was highlighted might be uh, an answer for us as government as a door to how probably engage with communities and promote uh, the sound information. Um, uh, I agree with the idea that the use is one of the main uh, concepts that we should aim for, uh, that the identification of the status of the material is definitely a challenge. Uh, this would require local efforts, obviously, because in each country it's a different situation. And I know personally that we've been struggling in Chile how to solve this situation to give clarity, and this is something that we're still working on. But I thought that there was also an interesting uh, suggestion in terms of improving access regarding the, the uh, uh, more uh, sound databases. Uh, and I would like to ask you if there are any examples. I, I think that in your conclusions you cite a British Library me Mechanical Curator Initiative, but I don't know if there are other examples that you could cite or probably develop a little bit on that so that we can share that with our capitals. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marcella, for your for your questions and for your for your comments. Um, yeah. So, with respect to the um, existence of, of initiatives in the United Kingdom relating to uh, databases of public domain works, this is rather new. I mean, in the UK, we have a, a, an ongoing challenge um, with respect to digitizing holdings of memory institutions because these holdings often contain copyright material and the rights clearance uh, costs represent uh, insurmountable costs when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of individual works. Um, there's recently been, a, been initiatives in that direction with respect to orphan works uh, legislation in Europe and in, and in uh, the United Kingdom we have a, a, a licensing scheme through the Intellectual Property Office to try to uh, offer a, a license for institutions that want to use a work after conducting diligent search, which um, still resists diligent search and which is essentially an orphan work where the copyright holder cannot be identified. Um, so, so that's an, 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 an innovation that we're studying actually at the CREATE Center, looking at how it's going to actually play out and whether or not it's suitable for all types of institutional users because it has a small but still significant fee uh, on the positive side, it does appear to uh, allow commercial exploitation of the work during a seven-year period after it's after it's 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 uh, the, the the license has been paid. Um, but it's an interesting innovation. We're, we're interested in learning more about that. I think the 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 uh, mechanical curator project is a effort by British Library to make available images which are inside of books, illustrations, and they. They automatically digitized a huge amount of books in the British Library, but all of those books are out of copyright. They're, they're public domain books. And so the mechanical creator uh, team are fairly confident that the illustrations contained in those books are also out of copyright. Um, but they've made them available on Flickr, 
in a searchable way, and then they've used the crowd to add metadata to the digitized illustrations in the books. And I did something uh, fun with it uh, a month ago. I made a font using, you know how at the beginning of an old book, sometimes the first letter is quite, um, you know, Baroque and ornate. You can actually string those together and make, and make words out of the old um, f typefaces of these old books. So there's lots of interesting, um, you know, potentially interesting downstream uses that would come out of that, that project. And uh, we're, we are certainly interested in, in those types of innovations. Um, and I'm happy to speak with you more offline about um, uh, Chile because that sounds like a really interesting um, uh, case study. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I got to turn mine off. There. Perfect. Hello, um, I'm also from University of Washington in Seattle. Um, my question is how you came up with the value chain model for creative business. Um, I was wondering if you could um, elaborate more on how you came up with these six categories from procurement to users, considering um, which, you know, like um, factors that you are considered, um, if there's any unique to creative business. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your question, and uh, hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so this, um, the value chain uh, uh, model, uh, I think, was first um, developed by, by Porter in the 1980s, around about 1985. And um, it has been uh, fairly widely um, used in the media management literature, uh, which focuses on, uh, you know, the management of media businesses. Um, and this, this one uh, is adapted from uh, a variety of different sources. Um, I recommend having a look at Eris and Bugen, uh, 2009, if, if you're interested in, in this uh, concept. They, they've got a quite sophisticated um, approach to uh, value chain analysis of media, you know, vertically and horizontally in integrated ver media businesses. Here, um, you know, and we're, we're really just drawing from, from other literature here uh, folk in terms of defining what happens at the different stages. Um, one, one innovation, perhaps, is that we've added the user uh, in position five, that that's a relatively new new concept, um, you know, and and we see that discussed in more recent literature on the sharing economy, that uh, a step in the value generation process and value capture process might be actually in the hands of users and outside of the boundaries of the formal business, um, and and we think we are observing that in some of the business models uh, in our in our public domain. Uh, work and, and we, we do find that quite interesting. <clears throat> you know, I, um, my name is Maria Silk. I'm a consultant for uh, WIPOLEX at WIPO. Uh, and uh, my question is more a practical one uh, because uh, m much of your data relies uh, on public dom domain, public domain uh, relies on Wikipedia. I was wondering how reliable is this da that da data are because, for example, I'm a, a content uh, producer, yes, and I want to, to, to use a certain image and I don't go to Wikipedia. Can I actually trust them? Uh, given especially uh, your example with, uh, with the picture of Rudyard Kipling. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you. That's a, re that's a really great question and a tough question. Um, the, the, uh, <clears throat> there are two, two issues with reliability of Wikipedia on our side. One is the reliability of the data that we were able to access because as you, you saw, a lot of our findings depend on, um, depend on the reported amount of traffic that um, that that was received before and after the magic date of um, 2009. That's how we derive the, the 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 value generated by our by our um, our public domain sample. So uh, we used we used Wikipedia's um, publicly available uh, tool, which allows you to search on. Um, uh, any Wikipedia subpage and it, and it reports traffic on a rolling historical basis, um, and uh, you know it spits out a figure 
of um, you know 12,000 visitors in April of 2012, and 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 that's what we've gone with. Uh, uh, now we uh, I suppose. Uh, that's it, and in their reported um, documentation for that tool, it says it, it's pulled directly from the Wikipedia logs. Um, but we don't know, you know, precisely how many of those visitors are in fact robotic crawlers or actual page views, or we just have to use the reported numbers that we've got from their tool. Uh, as a result of this study, we have made contact with um, Wikipedia, Wikimedia Foundation. They have validated our, our findings internally, uh, and they've all offered us an opportunity to work with them more on uh, a, a, ver a similar type of study, um, but of mutual benefit to both parties. And then we would have access to their internal traffic reporting. So hopefully then we'll have more, even more precise and reliable traffic data, but we don't have that yet. On the, the case of um, you know, liability for copyright infringing uses of work which is reported to be in the public domain on Wikipedia but may not in fact be in the public domain, um, that I, I, I think that's a very interesting question and I, and, I, and, I, I, and I don't know the answer. All that I can say is that, uh, and we talked about this over, over lunch, that the, um, the whole system of Wikipedia is based on crowd uh, wisdom. And so the, the, the uploader of the image is the one making the claim about the copyright status of the work. And there's no one single rights clearance specialist at Wikipedia whose job it is to take responsibility for the, for the, for the status of the images. And so it comes from the crowd. Um, but you know, on the other hand, uh, when we are talking about collect, huge collections of, of work, crowdsource diligent search and other crowd forms of, of aggregating content may be uh, a useful solution. But finding a regulatory uh, solution to the problem of liability when we're talking about crowdsourced um, content is, is a really interesting paper, and I encourage you to uh, ask more questions about that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let me maybe ask one question which um, is really not that much related to your study, more to what you said at the outset, what your overall objectives were going into that. And I think, you know, the work that you've done, and one has to start somewhere, and I think you've, you've really broken new ground here, you know, really has a focus on, on, on creative works. Um, if you think of the public domain, that, of course, also includes you know, in patented inventions of which the patents have expired, uh, for which there's a great interest, especially in a place like WIPO, um, you know, where, um, you know, especially in developing countries, many of the patents <coughs> are not, you know, many of the patents that exist in the developed world don't even exist in the developing world. Are you aware of ev evidence of any attempts, you know, to quantify First of all, the, the, the importance, the, the size of the public domain, but also potentially how it is used. Uh, yeah, that, um, thank you for that, that uh, tough question as well. Uh, well, the, um, uh, of course, I'm, I'm, you're, you're more familiar than I am about the, the research on patents. And I'm sure that, that there is research on, on what happens to patents after they expire. Um, and, and, and actually, that's a, it's a good um, nudge to, to encourage us to go and look at some of that literature because I'm sure that there's interesting insights there that might be able to be translated to this um, copyright-related work. So thank you for that, that suggestion, and we will follow up on that. I think that's a good one. In terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, other research that I'm aware of that, that tries to get a grip on the size of public domain, I, I said at the beginning of my talk Rufus Pollock's work um, he, he looked at, um, I believe he looked at all of the, the holdings of the uh, Cambridge University libraries uh, and, and, look and, and essentially put a, an exact number on the number of books held by the library which are in the public domain and it's vast and it outnumbers the works which were, which were, which were in copyright. Um, uh, and, and we've also been uh, encouraged to think about other kinds of public domain information and you know in our definition uh, at the beginning you know, it's clear that we are focused here on um, on traditional creative outputs like books and and movies and films and video games, but um, but you know, uh, uh, an increasing amount of material that we all rely on in our daily lives is open source software, 
um, and and you know some of the literature in the um, in this uh, user-led innovation by von Hippel and others. I mean, does does uh, talk about uh, software. Um, uh, innovation where there's proprietary code and there's open source code, and that that in, that that, that um, negotiation of that of that tension for for organizations is actually quite interesting, and I I think does shed light on our research. And and as we go forward with this study, we're going to be looking at some of uh, some of that literature. In particular, the decision of firms to drop their proprietary software and instead pick up and incorporate. Uh, open source um, platforms and the costs and benefits associated with 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 that. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> well, it was a challenging question or provocative question. Um, other questions? I think you impressed them all, uh, or you um, uh, left no doubts in their mind about the value of the public domain. So let me thank you once more uh, for your presentation, and um, we look forward to, to um, the future research work that will um, come not only from you, but from, from Create more generally. So thank you, Christopher.